Hello, my name is Sonia Kahn and I'm the subject coordinator for cell biology and genetics at UTS College. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to CBG. So we're on the fourth or the fifth module today. So today we're going to be looking at protein structure. As always, stop me at any point uh, to ask questions. This is meant to be an online engagement between yourselves and myself. So let's just look in at what we're going to get through today, okay? We are firstly going to look at how you would do a protein assay in the lab. So a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the glucose assay and we looked at the idea that you can generate a standard curve, you can read off that standard curve, and from that, you can estimate an unknown concentration of glucose. Today's no different. We're going to be doing that exact same thing, except we're going to be using what's called a Lowry assay. Now, when I'm working in industry, I do oh, probably about 10, 20 of these a year. Okay, so they are very common. Uh, they're used in industry. Same principle though, you generate a standard curve, you generate some unknowns and you read off it. So we're going to be looking through that. I'm going to show you a lab video on what it is to have a Lowry assay. We're going to actually work through some exercises together and that will be part of your submission. Secondly though, I'm gonna take it one step further with being online and we're actually going to look at some professional models. So as you know, I work in the workplace as well. And when I'm in the workplace, I work exclusively with proteins. It's really important with the type of proteins that I work with to understand what is their structure. And particularly if I'm looking at active sites, we've done enzymes and the idea that there is a particular part of an enzyme that has an active region with, act with the substrate. It's really important that we understand how to use professional modeling programs because they can actually model what that protein looks like. We can look at that cavity, we can look at that active site and say, okay, well this molecule will fit in, but not that one. So I wanna introduce you to molecular modeling. Okay, and as you progress through your career, you'll get more and more comfortable with pain with these type of packages. Okay, on that note then, is there any questions just stemming from that? But let's go through what we're going to do today. Two objectives. The first instance, we're going to be looking at performing a Lowry protein assay. That is identifying an unknown concentration of protein based on a standard curve. In the second instance, we're going to start looking at some computer simulations, some molecular modeling programs, and use them to better understand how proteins come together. That is from the primary through the, to the quaternary structure. Starting off though, let's look at the protein assay. Just as we did with the glucose, we're going to generate a standing curve, a standard curve with increasing concentration of protein moving left to right, we'll get increasing color intensity. That's what we would experience in the lab. We would then plot that out, exactly the same as we did when we did the glucose assay. On the x-axis, we will put the concentration of albumin. On the y-axis, we'll put the absorbance with which we read it. So with increasing color intensity, it will correlate to increasing albumin concentration. Then we come in with an unknown exactly as we see it a couple of weeks ago. Here's our unknown, and we determine that unknown concentration to be 0.5 absorbent students. Now we could do the old fashioned method and we could read across 0.5, read it to the standard line, drop in a point and read it down to the baseline. Based on that, we'd say, we've got about 50 microliters in albumin. But we've also learned that you can quantify that to a greater degree of accuracy. And you do that by using the equation. So making X the subject in this equation, substituting 0.5 in for Y, 
we'd get a precise value of 47.6 micromolar. These are the types of calculations we're going to be practicing again today. Looking at the chemistry of the assay, like all good scientists, we need to understand what it is we're doing and why we're doing it. So it's a two-step process. In the first instance, we're going to come in with our protein. We're going to add a Lowry copper reagent. Now that carries a two plus charge, copper two plus. In the presence of base, we get the formation of a protein copper one complex. That's the first stage of our experiment. In the second stage, we add something called folin. That folin reacts with the protein complex and it will turn a darker blue or a purple colour. It is that protein com complex in step three that we're measuring the absorbance of at, seven, at rather 620 nanometers. So the higher amount of protein that we start off with, the greater the concentration of protein copper one, the greater the concentration of protein complex, and the greater the absorbance we get. Today's prac goes from page 32 of your lab manual all the way through to page 40 but we are only going to be doing the experimental part of this prac, which finishes on page 35. The prac today is gonna to be demonstrated by the ever so lovely Charlotte Fleming. So first step is labeling our tubes with tubes A through D, each of them containing a different protein. So we always need to make sure that we label our tubes so that we do not get confused. Tube A will have our standard albumin solution. Tube B will have our casein dilution. Tube C will have our gelatin dilution. And then tube D will have an albumin dilution. Next, we're going to be making a dilution of our stock albumin solution. So to do this, we're gonna be adding 100 microliters of the standard to 1.9 mils of ultra pure water or 1,900 microliters. So Charlotte's gonna be taking her P100 pipette and setting it to 100 microliters and then taking 100 microliters of this albumin and putting it into tube A. Next step is to make the casein dilution, which is a 1 in 40 dilution of the casein stock. So to do this, we're going to add 50 microliters of the stock casein to 1.95 mils of ultra pure water. So to do this, Charlotte is taking the P100 and setting it to 50 microliters, which she will then pipette into tube B. Because we've diluted our proteins, we want to give it a good mix on the vortex to ensure that that protein is evenly distributed throughout the solution. Next, we'll label our tubes one through eight. We're heading over to the fume hood to add our Lowry reagent. All you need to do for this is lift up the preset dropper and then drop it into the tube and it will dispense four mils of our Lowry reagent into each of the tubes. Following that, we're gonna mix it and then leave it to stand for 20 minutes at room temperature. The next step is to add the FC reagent. It's the same principle as the last step, so you just lift the automated dispenser and drop it and that will add 400 microliters of the reagent into each tube. Okay, so in the lab, just cutting it down, uh, a little bit of the spiel that she did. In the first instance, she prepared dilutions of the known proteins. Okay, so, uh, sorry, the unknown proteins rather. So she had casein, she had gelatin, and these went into test tubes six, seven, and eight. 
She also prepared a standard curve. So we had incrementally larger volumes of protein go across tubes one to six, one to five rather. She added four mils of a Lowry copper reagent, incubated for 20 minutes, and then she added 0.4 mils of the folin and incubated, in her instance, another 30 minutes. Finally, reading their samples at 620 nanometers. So let's firstly look at the unknowns. So she had the unknowns in tubes six, seven, and eight. But before she actually added them to the tubes, she diluted those. The reason being that if the concentration of protein is too high to start with, when you start adding your Lowry's and your Folin, the color intensity will be so high that you cannot get an accurate reading. So recall through Beer Lambert's law, that you do not want to be reading an absorbance above one because it will not be deemed accurate. So we're diluting these unknown proteins to make sure that the concentration gets within a threshold that obeys Beer-Lambert's law and also makes the unknowns of a comparable concentration to what we have in our standard curve. On that basis, she should be now equipped to do the online exercises. So within those, and I'm gonna go back to Canvas now, you'll be tested on your understanding of dilution factors. How did we calculate the dilution factors specifically with KC? Your understanding of how the assay works. So I've looked at it briefly and said, well, we add Lowry, we add Folin. And specifically, I want you to be thinking about what factors may adversely affect your results. So in the lab, obviously, if you've got someone that's not rinsing your cuvette tubes out properly, it is going to affect your results. I want you to be actively thinking about what other factors. And finally, your ability to quantify unknown protein concentrations. On that note, We'll now move across to Canvas, okay? And we'll look at the activities that you have online today. The first one, we're looking at primary dilutions. The albumin standard was supplied at 10 milligrams per mil. We took 100 microliters and added it to 1900, and there's our primary dilution. So I want you to know or rather you to calculate what will be the concentration of the album in that primary dilution. I want you to look at the dilution factors on the unknowns. So we've effectively used casein gelatin and two different albumin solutions. I want you to identify what dilution factors were used in preparing each of those. We look at the net amounts of protein so we know what albumin we started off with, it was 10 milligrams per mil. We've diluted that initially by a factor of one in 20 or a varying factor. And in the case of the standard tube, we added 0.1 mils of this already diluted albumin into tube two. I want you to calculate what would that be as a net amount of protein. So we've got a concentration of protein, we've got a dilution factor. I want you to quantify that as being an actual net amount of protein, that is micrograms total. Next one I want you to be looking at is reliability of the assay. So that assay that we just talked about, we added Lowry and that had a copper two plus, and that copper two plus was converted to a one plus, and then ultimately to a blue complex. But that assay is not necessarily, or not directly rather, quantifying protein concentration. It is quantifying tryptophan residues. Okay, so I'll say that again. That assay is not directly quantifying protein, rather it is quantifying tryptophans. Now tryptophan is a type of amino acid. 
So I want you to be thinking about if we've got different types of proteins, we could add four different proteins at the same concentration into this assay and we might get four different results. I want you to be thinking about how reliable is that assay based on the fact that we're measuring tryptophans, which are cyclic amino acids, as opposed to a gross protein concentration. Okay, so I'm not gonna answer that question for you, but I want you to be thinking it through. Individuals will then be giving a, a Lowry protein assay, okay, and some concentrations to do. So I will provide you with a standard curve. You will get the data as you would coming out of a live experiment. All of the data for the standard curve, the measurements of absorbance for an unknown, and you'll need to do some calculations upon it. And that's where these final two ones come into, the Lowry protein assay and the concentrations. As you can see here, they are pulled from a bank. So not everybody is going to have the same questions. That's the first bit. Are there any questions stemming from that? So this is the Lowry assay, and this is how you actually physically quantify protein in a lab. On that note, I'll leave you. We've gone on a little bit longer today. I will make sure that you've got online uh, all of those videos, all of those worksheets, and you've got till midnight tonight to sit in. I'm going to be online now for about another hour. So if you've got questions, ask them. My only recommendation is that you also start with the Lowry assay before you get to the molecular modeling. And specifically the questions students have most problems with tend to be those concentration factors. Okay, so make sure that you're um, asked that question, working through those questions while I'm online to help. If you're not confident to speak up, you've got the chat to talk through. Okay, I'll leave you to your own devices. I will check on Canvas in the background and make sure all your resources are available. Thanks guys.